Ian Ferguson, my friend, welcome to Men This Way. It's a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored to be asked and uh, I hope to have a really rewarding and fulfilling conversation for the next 50, 60 minutes. I have no doubt that we will. You know, Ian, I remember uh, we first, I don't, I don't know if you could say we met. We met. We did meet. We met. Our eyes met. We met. I think we <laughs> were introduced and we shared space for, for a moment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah for, 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 for a moment. I remember it was at the Wanderlust Sexuality Symposium. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I remember I was, uh, your wife was speaking on stage that day. Uh, she blew my damn mind as she <laughs> does regularly. And um, I was speaking as well. And, and, uh, but I remember just looking at you and, and I remember we, we did, at least did the head nod. Um, and I remember thinking, man, he looks like a really kind warm hearted person. Hmm. Just want you to know that that's what my just initial immediate impression of you was. Sweet. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So I'm excited to, to dive in with you today. Uh, I know you've uh, been on an incredible journey. Uh, well, in a lifetime, this lifetime, but certainly in the last, uh, how long has it been since, since you left your last marriage and, 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 and then even partnered up with Jaya? Uh, it's been about 12, 13, I was actually thinking about this yesterday, Thir I think it's exactly about 13 years okay. since uh, my, the marriage I was in ended, and then I met Jaya about a year, a little more than a year later. So she and I are about to celebrate our 12th anniversary. Wow. Wow. Well, congratulations. Thank you. That is no small feat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it's uh, it's been one of the most educational journeys of my life mm. well so, and, and we're going to explore that for sure but i i want to uh just introduce our audience to you a bit more before we dive into all that um and first though i, I you've been super busy this summer i know you're really busy um i've had to wait months to get you on this podcast um, worth waiting, so worth waiting for. But tell me, man, what are you really most excited for? Like this summer, what's going on for you? What are you really lit up about right now? There's a crazy birth emergence thing happening around the work that we've been putting out there for about five years. Jai has been at this for over 20 years. I kind of came in to partnering with her in business uh, really seriously about five years ago. But it, it was even from the very beginning of our relationship that I was starting to play around in what she was up to, helped her produce a series of films, all that sort of thing. Um, and about, I don't even know, six years ago now, Jaya really sort of crystallized on this thing called the erotic blueprints. Mm -hmm. And it's this typing system for a way of discovering your erotic self, what you're really turned on by, how to articulate it. It's a whole erotic, like it puts language to sex, where there just has not been a language for 10,000 years for people to actually talk about it. And yeah. And, and I just want to acknowledge, and, and I'll, I'll also have said this in the introduction yeah. that the erotic blueprints have been profoundly those five erotic blueprints. And we'll, and we'll get to those a little bit later. Cool. Um, but those, those blueprints for me and my lady Sylvie, man, yeah. they have been so helpful awesome. in having a language for yeah. our different approaches to sexuality so yes. man it's been super super helpful so uh, but we'll get into that a little, little bit later but keep going like what are you really sure, excited yeah. about this and it just, that, that's the kind of thing that i love to hear and i hear yeah. it from pretty much everybody who has contact with them yeah. that's why they're there that's the thing that so that seed got planted and now the bloom is on the bush and huge huge potentialities are coming into existence um so what's what's up is really the expansion of this mission mm. and it's a mission at the core my something that's of pivotal importance to me is uh the ability for people to fully express themselves you know consensually but fully express what they're up to what they love who they are freely and it's in a, in a in a world that's safe and can receive it not judge it you may not be your thing, but, uh, you know, don't yuck my yum, basically. Like, if we're all, ha if we're all consensually playing and playing full out, we're going to have a lot of different flavors going on. 
And my dream world is a world where that gets to express itself freely. Yeah. And the thing that's starting to, you know, the, the, the bloom that's on the bush is this thing that I, I kind of hesitate to say it because it's not manifest yet, but it's this concept of really creating pleasure island like mm. literal pockets on the planet where mm. people can uh, be in this conversation, this highly mm. conscious conversation mm -hmm. that has consent boundaries, but allows people to play full out yeah. and kind of like, uh, I don't, do you know Buckminster Fuller? Yeah. Okay. So he always talked about, you know, don't fight the powers that be mm -hmm. Just create the thing that yeah. you're out to create yeah. and the people will gravitate towards it. So that's the kind of energy from the coaches that we're training to some of the clients that are coming in and seeing and business people who are coming in and seeing kind of a, a bigger picture of yeah. the potentialities of what we've been working on. And it just, it feels like it's right on this precipice of like, mm. oof. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, the shape current. of our live events is changing and transforming. Mm. Mm. The kind of experiences that people are coming out of those events with uh, have radically transformed over the last just year because some of the things that have happened for Jaya and I have rolled into our you know personally on a personal front they've rolled into our business uh -huh. and, and just the energy that exists at the core is totally transforming everything. So it's got, it, got it, man. So I want to slow you down a little just because <laughs> I I can really tell there's yeah. so much brimming yeah. and brimming yeah. and bursting <laughs> for you. And uh, I, I just want to help our, our listeners because a lot of them, may, maybe most of them, have never heard of Jaya or yeah. of Ian Ferguson or of the Erotic Blueprints. Or, and so, um, um, but again, I'm telling you, man, Sylvie and I, we're, we're, we're huge fans. Uh, by the way, uh, Jaya, Sylvie wants to have Jaya on her podcast. Oh, cool. She's, okay. Sylvie's rocking it on Instagram. So we're going to make that connection. It's got to happen. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and we'll definitely, we're definitely coming to your pleasure Island. Okay, when cool. That, when that happens. You're invited. Abs absolutely. Um, but let's take a step back for, for a moment, Ian. And, and, um, I'd love to hear about a significant event or experience in your early life that has played a fundamental role in shaping you as a man. Cool. Yeah. Um, I would say it's, it's it's two experiences happening in conjunction with each other. So when I was a kid, I was a bit of a unique flower. <laughs> I tend to make some choices that uh, the other people of my gender were not making. So I really was turned on by dance. And for whatever reason, five, six years old, uh, I told my mom, hey, I want to learn to tap dance. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I saw like Fred Astaire or Gene Kelly or some, you know, one of those guys in a Sunday movie thing. I was like, that's cool. And my mom said I danced from the moment I was like, was on my feet in my cradle. So there was this thing in me and making that choice in the zone of the world that I grew up in Ohio uh, was not necessarily like the thing that most boys did. So it set me up to be yeah. you know, different. Yeah. And in that, I had an experience of, uh, uh, you know, it turned into an experience of bullying and exclusion, um, mm -hmm. you know, being called faggot and all the things that had me saying, well, wait, I'm just having fun. I'm doing this thing. And now what does that mean? I played some sports as well, but I didn't excel in those areas. So there was this internal questioning that was going on of like, well, what does that mean? Somebody's calling me faggot. I'm this, that, the other, who am I? Yeah. So in, in the face of that, at the same time, because I'm in this dance community, I'm like one of three or four guys who studied this dance studio that had hundreds of girls studying at it. So I would walk in as a seven year old boy and there'd be 30 <laughs> five year old girls who, uh -huh in the waiting room to go into the class and it was like being a rock star because yeah. I was like, I was yeah. the guy. Yeah. At <laughs> so, seven. Almost. At seven. Is that too, I don't know. Is that too young to appreciate it? I don't know. Well, it was a feeling like I knew like <laughs> so I had all sorts of philosophies that developed about like yeah. 
hierarchy of 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 girls and like yeah. here's the girls who are the ones who are going to cling here's the ones who are self possessed here's the ones who want something from me but I'm like wow oh, fascinating much. so I had this experience of being you know kind of like spat upon <laughs> in one culture and being like this megastar wow. in this other so the uh, wow. holding those polarities yeah. also had me you know kind of like the philosophy I talked to at the beginning of the thing which is this thing about being safe to be fully self-expressed. Yeah. That is, be, became fundamental to my core. I mean, I gave high school speeches about it. I was, you know, I, I dressed in ways that would confront people because I was trying to push the edge of what was acceptable. Wow. So yeah. I, I had both of those polarities and I would say that even in the work, uh, you know, in my play work and my work work in my twenties and my thirties, it was a driving force. And then especially even coming into with the work with Jaya, where my fundamental core might be about free self-expression, when I started to walk through the gate of sex and sexuality, uh, I was like, ah, oh, this, man, people are, this is a place where people are really yeah. caught up, yeah. really strung out, and really hiding parts of themselves because they're scared, there's shame, there's trauma. So to be able to step into somebody's bedroom is stepping into their entire world. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm, I very much relate to that, that provocateur rebel. I'm not a provocateur. I don't live to provoke, but I also don't mind provoking. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm open to be to provoking, even though I don't seek to provoke. And I, I was in the military and I remember the military is not a culture where you question things. <laughs> and I remember, um, whenever the big generals would come to town and they'd get all the troops together and give us the speeches and then they'd open it up for, for questions. I was always the guy with the first, with the first one to raise his hand. And I would ask the question that went right just maybe just beyond the line of what was acceptable to ask. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and not so far that I would get in real trouble, but yeah. definitely far enough that my immediate commander would look at me sideways like Reeves. Are you kidding me? <laughs> right. I lived for it. And it was, it was, so the military was not really a place that I could thrive. I was that, that same Colonel said, you're either going to be a, a, f a four star general someday, or you're going to go nowhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one or the other okay, one or the other one or the other <laughs> i took i was like i'm going nowhere i'm out yeah awesome <laughs> so i can really really uh appreciate that and i know now you were married for a time in a monogamous relationship correct yeah yeah for sure and you that that relationship ended and then you met jaya a year later Mm -hmm. And you entered into, were you seeking an open, I don't know if that's the right term, open relationship, but. So um, that's just a whole, that's a universe in and of itself. Yes. Um, in terms of, so all I knew was monogamy. I mean, I heard about swinging and, and then right, right. open relationship and that sort of thing throughout my entire life. But yes. uh, my marriage, a huge problem with my marriage was the sex life. And mm -hmm. I was the culprit, like the, the inability for me to stay present, stay grounded mm -hmm. and really see my wife through to her pleasure. I got caught up in my head. Mm -hmm. Am I doing this right? This is taking too long. I don't know what I'm doing. So I was in this loop of failure. And in that, it shut things down, shut things down for her. Other communic we were really great communicators. Like we had communication down. <laughs> How long were you in that that so-called failure loop for? Um, six years. I mean, like it, it it was brought to my attention like a steam train the night of our first night of our honeymoon in Europe, where wow. finally she came forward and said, "I'm not getting my needs met. It's my turn now." Wow. And right from there, it was just like, "Oh, I'm." I'm swimming upstream and my confidence dropped my sense of like, I don't know how to provide yeah. and you know, any number of sort of juvenile excuses, uh, undeveloped psychology, just let me use those excuses to kind of keep falling back. So, uh, 
the good thing coming out of that is within a couple of weeks, within a few weeks of the, us officially ending our marriage, it, I, it just got really clear, like, hey, wow, this, I'm taking 100% responsibility for this piece. Yeah. And so what is there for me to do about that piece? And I didn't go study a bunch of sexuality work or go into Tantra workshops or didn't like pursue things on some kind of like get all the information front. But for whatever reason, I knew what it was, was my lack of ability to be present, to just drop in no matter what's going on, continue to be curious, be present, hold the energy with my partner. You know what occurs to me too, as you're, as you were sharing that, that, I, I, I think, I believe so many men, we kind of live with a persistent fear that I can't satisfy my partner. Mm-hmm. Um, and so much of our attempts to satisfy are really wrapped up in us looking good yes, rather than in actually satisfying mm-hmm. our, our partner. Um, so I just wanted to really uh, emphasize that because I think you're, you're pointing at something, your experience that you're talking about there you know, I, I think is, is, is very universal. And I think there's a truth to it in a sense. Mark Twain, Mark Twain once remarked that, that, you know, a woman is the most powerful person in the world because she could tire out an army of men. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and right. sexually speaking, she can keep yeah. going, yeah. you know, as men are just dropping left and right. <laughs> So and I've never forgotten. He may have not said it exactly like that. Don't get angry at Mark Twain if that sounds offensive. <laughs> but um, but just the point is that yeah, there is a there is a, a hunger and that feminine yearning for 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 love and connection and deep satisfaction that men, especially when we're orgasming, and we haven't had any. Uh, uh, we have no skill really, other than maybe what we learned watching porn or hearing our fathers talk shit or our uncles or friends on the playground or whatever. So I just want to acknowledge that that's pretty, I would think that's pretty damn universal. I think it's super common. I think it's super common. And then where do you go? Where do you look? Where do you find accurate sex education? And this is one of the things that we get into in our uh, first weekend workshop is like, where did you learn what you know? And because we, mm-hmm. we, we were all educated around sex, mm-hmm. if you didn't have sex education in school. You're picking stuff up from your culture, your religion, from your friends on the playground, from porn, from the, yeah. you know, the magazines that you and I jumped into dumpsy dumpsters to find for the porn magazines when we were teenagers. Like that was our education. Yeah. yeah. And that is not connection. That is not connecting to our own pleasure. Because, like, you know, I don't know if you experience this, but, but one of the things that turns me on the most is when my partner is in deep pleasure. Yeah. And it's not different the other way around. Like, the feminine and the traditional feminine masculine, feminine sexuality can be very uh, narcissistic. Like, it, 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 it has an edge where it can be very narcissistic mm-hmm. to the masculine sexual energy. But there is that thing where when your partner knows, like if my, my partner knows that I'm in pleasure, then the stage performance goes away on their part. It's mm-hmm. no longer trying to make me feel okay that I'm doing a good job. Mm-hmm. They can then get lost. They can relax and surrender and I can surrender. And then we can find a place where we're surrendering together. Where the dance becomes fluid. Right. And it's a shared experience, but we're both fully in this what might be considered a narcissistic or selfish yeah. experience of like this is what's turning me on yeah so being able to being able to be exposed in one's deepest pleasure in front of another person be able to surrender and lose yourself is one of the most vulnerable if not the most vulnerable place to be yeah. in in human relating and we're all looking i think you know, this is an extrapolation, but I think we're all seeking that kind of experience when we're with the person we love. Now, I don't imagine you brought that wisdom into relationship with Jaya. Um, so this fully is, formed anyway, I should say. You know, well, I mean, it's always a journey, right? Like there's always more, there's yeah. always the next 
edge of like, oh my God, I didn't even know I could experience that much pleasure, yeah. or that much freedom, or that much surrender. But the end of my marriage was a fulcrum turning point. And then there were a couple of little steps that happened before I ended up meeting Jaya, where I went back into a relationship pretty quickly out of the marriage. Beautiful woman, really sexy, really attractive, the sexuality. And I, and I had made this one decision already. Like, okay, it's about presence. I just mm. got to be with this person. Totally transformed things. All of a sudden, you know. And just to, and just to, just to ask, just really ground that in. Because yeah. we hear this word a lot, especially in, in men's work, presence. Mm. Mm-hmm. When you, that, that epiphany, okay, it's about presence. What did that actually look like for you? Like, what did that actually mean? Like, like what's a, what was something that you would actually practice in these sexual occasions that for you and for your partner meant I'm being more present? So it's paying attention and paying attention to just putting all of the focus right here with this person and being curious. So some of it would be, um, I'm, I'm just kind of getting caught up in my head a little bit because these things vary with the type of partner you're with and with the blueprints and all that sort of thing. Sure, but sure, in yeah. general, the, the, the thing is curiosity and being very, like bringing up heightening awareness. Like, okay, I'm touching this person in this way. And if it's a nonverbal thing, I'm looking for signals. Right. Is their breath deepening? Right. Have they closed their eyes? Are they tense? Intention isn't always a bad thing, but are they tense like pre-orgasm tense? What's, what, am I, what are the signals I'm picking right. up? Or, or, or tense like, don't touch me there. Or don't tense do that. Like, oh. or like, I didn't like that. Mm-hmm. Like it's gone too far too fast, yeah. that kind of thing. Ian, I, I just want to stay here for a minute, man, because this sure. is so important. And I'm, I'm, I'm reflecting on, I remember reading an article, I think it was, uh, what was the, what's the, well, what's his name? I can't remember, but one of these celebrities that caught, caught up in the Me Too uh, takedown, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, he, there, uh, a woman who was, who she felt was essentially raped by him tells the t- tells the tale about how he put her in his car on the way home from a club and basically you know her whole body was screaming no mm. but she never verbalized no mm-hmm. and she tells this incredible tale about her experience you know the 20 minutes or 30 minutes whatever it was from the club back to his home where she never said the words no but everything in her being was saying no yeah and they proceeded, they had sex and all of that. And, but she, and I, I think this is so fucking important mm. because, you know, I think in this day and age, what us men more than ever have to learn if we're going to stop hurting our, our, our women, even with the best of intentions, if we're going to stop hurting them, we have to pay attention, like you're saying, mm. to what her, what's her body is doing. Right. Not just what her mouth is saying. Yeah, exactly. So I just want to acknowledge that, man, because what you're what you're hitting on here, I think, just has ramifications beyond just you know sexual pleasure. Yeah, we're in a new we're 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 at a stage uh, of up leveling sexuality consciousness, sexuality communication, and there's a lot of pressure on the the those of us walking around with cocks between our legs. Mm-hmm to really up the game and not shy away from the conversation. The, the, there's still this desire for connection and love and healing and yeah. raw human amazing sex between people. That's all still there. But how we get there, the dialogue is shifted. Yeah. And there's some very important pieces to that. Um, and in presence and this awareness and this curiosity and listening, like, listening with the body and listening, you know, with like, you know, a maybe is a no, right? Yeah, so right. being able to make sure that you have full consent from a partner, from a lover before diving in. Right. And, and, and it could just be no for this moment. Exactly. And, and as we back off and, and help our partner feel safe again, 
mm-hmm. we might notice that her body and her and her words are saying, okay, now we can go further now because I feel safe. Yep. In this and, moment. Uh, you know, a, a really awesome thing about the no and, and listening to a no and receiving a no is once you can get really clear with the no, then you can trust the yes that mm. much. So I like when, that. When that partner says, no, take it as a gift. Like they've given you a boundary. And if they feel you, the safety piece you're talking about, if they feel that they've been heard, that boundary has been held, that you can hold it for them, even yeah. if maybe they're like, nah, they don't think they, 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 they don't have the um, courage to hold it for themselves. Then it all just starts to open up. Like then you get real trust, then you get consistency of action and the ability to uh, share more deeply. Like the intimacy can then flower and open up. The teacher Byron Katie Yes. She has this great quote that, that really played a, a fundamental role, just this idea and that sh- in shifting my relationship to my own sexuality. And, and it was, uh, she said, just because a man has an erection doesn't mean we need to do anything with it. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh my God. I mean, that was just such a gift. Yeah. It was such a gift. Cause I, I, I love how, like you, what you just said, um, hearing no and, and trusting the no and, and really allowing the no, you didn't, these are my words, not yours, but really letting that no be real and be honored. It, it means we can trust then when she says, or he says, yes. Yeah. Yep. And I think that's, I think that's really uh, profound. We, we got to get real clear with our fuck no's, right? Yeah. Like, and, and clear that it's okay. Even if I'm a maybe I can be a fuck no for now. Like you said, for now, yeah. that's right. For now. for now yay <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. cool exactly. i mean even even just as a coach learning to learning to really embrace uh a, a potential client saying no really really even inviting it uh-huh. yep. creates a safety and and also it just helps me fucking relax as a coach and gets yep. my neediness out of the way uh-huh. And even as a coach or a sexual partner, when I, I, you know, when, when the person in front of me knows that they're safe to say no, they're so much more inclined to actually say yes. Actually say yes. Exactly. Yeah. Because it's no longer transactional. That's right. Like, what are we sharing together? Yeah. Let's just get real about what we're sharing together. Yeah. So So a question um, yeah. For you, just because of, of again your experience, and um, uh, th- I think your interview is going to come out a week or two after I speak with uh, Robert Kendall. Uh-huh. You know Robert? I do. Yeah. Yeah. So Robert's a good friend of mine here, and and of course, you know Robert and I were we've talked about uh, all kinds of his experiences with polyamory. You know, two sums, three sums, four sums, mm. five sums. I don't know how many sums he's done, but he's done it all. You know, polyamory, swingers, orgies, all that. And, um, but I'm curious to hear from you because, and, and by the way, are you and Jaya, are you still, would you still call your relationship an open relationship or what, how would you, how do you, what, what are the boundaries or the agreements in your relationship today? If I'm asking. <laughs> so I don't know, like if we're going to get, um, that, I think based on some of the questions you sent my way, we'll probably open up this can of worms as we go deeper in the inner. <laughs> <laughs> and again, whole, you're always free to say, I don't want to answer that. Yeah, no, no. I'm, I'm all good with answering all yeah. of it. Okay. I just don't, uh, uh, this context is, is pretty vast. Well, well the, question, the question really that I'm ultimately leading to here, just so you know, to kind of foreshadow where I'm going with this, why I'm asking this is, is, um, is, is polyamory or open relationships. There's this idea out there, especially amongst many men, that, that monogamy is not so-called natural and that therefore the presumption is it would be easier for me if I just open myself up and have multiple partners and don't, don't monogamize myself to one person. <laughs> and so that's kind of where I'm going with this. It's, I'm not trying to pry. I'm really w- seeking your wisdom based on your experience. Mm. You know, is it, I don't, not, is it natural or not? That's, I think it's yes and no, but is it, is it, is it, um, is it easier? Uh-huh. Is uh-huh. kind of where I'm going with this. Yeah. 
Um, I would not say that it is easier. So I would say, just to answer your question about Jaya and I, we are in an open relationship. Um, the When we start talking about poly, open, swinger, like the definitions in many ways have kind of fallen away. Yeah. Um, just because of some big growth pieces that the two of us have been through. Mm. Um, and I would, I would say that the practice of polyamory, practice of open relationship or don't ask, don't tell or swinging, um, they all have different flavors. Yeah. And the one that interests me or the sort of category that interests me the most in terms of human consciousness is more in this kind of a open slash poly dynamic where, where there, where it's not a don't ask, don't tell. It's like, it's the ability to really fully express yourself with your partner, be fully seen mm-hmm. or who you are, who you're attracted to, what's turning you on and to have the opening to be able to witness that and be present with all of who your partner is. Yeah. So for some people, it can be very challenging just to hear that their partner is attracted to somebody else. Right. And just, just that what, they're attracted, not even doing anything about it. They're just not even doing anything. Just like, oh, I find that person hot. Oh my God, that ass turned me on. Right. Well, I can't believe you just looked at that woman's ass walking. Right. Or I can't believe that uh, you know you find that that guy attractive. You know, just like. Right the insecurity that can come up for anybody in any partnership, uh, the jealousy, all the the layers that go on there. So, and that's, that's where the transition point came from me going from a monogamous lifestyle to a poly lifestyle. After my marriage, I was in two relationships, fairly short lived, but there were two relationships where the, the ethic, the idea was basically monogamy. The first person I was with didn't even want to hear anything about my, um, my, my ex-wife, whom I just ended my relationship with three, three months before. Mm. Been with her for eight years. <laughs> kind of a big part of who I'd right. become. And <laughs> um, so I was okay with that for a while. Yeah. And then I started to go, wait a second. I can't be me. And so that relationship came to a close. I got into another relationship with another woman. And not the same constriction. She could hear about my ex-wife. We could talk about all sorts of things. But I noticed these little things of like, oh, if I express this about myself, it's a big closing down. Or it's like, uh, there's an edge there. So I just started to go like, man, this I'm not down for this. I'm not down for being in a relationship. Because I did this in my marriage for six years. Yeah. And, it, and it failed. Yeah, I'm not down to do this again. And that's when I heard about polyamory. So it was before I met Jaya that I took on a philosophy and when I entered it, I entered it with a couple of promises to myself. One, that just saying flat out, this is who I am, this is what I'm experimenting with. And that any person, any person that was interested in dating, that was essentially the first part of the conversation I'd have with them. Was, hey, I'm interested in you, I'd like to go out and you need to know this. I consider myself polyamorous. I'm dating multiple people and I'm not interested in being with one person. Mm. Um, so, but back to the question that you were talking about, about and just quick and quick, how old were you when you divorced? Um, what was that? I was, uh, 39. Okay. So you just spent your thirties in a monogamous relationship. Yeah. And my twenties were all monogamous based relationship. And yeah. Okay. So that was my, that was the soup I swam. And I didn't know anybody who was poly that when I claimed yeah. this to myself, I just heard about this. You're, you're from Ohio. I get it. <laughs> hey, there's a lot of, there's a lot of weird people in Ohio. <laughs> I, especially, especially these days we're all coming yeah. out of the closet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think Columbus actually has the highest LGBTQ uh, population in the United States. Okay, cool. Which is really interesting. Um, but uh, related to the question, which is a very interesting one, is this, this, there's this idea that it's easier. And you, it's, uh, you're inviting more complexity when you're inviting more than one partner, especially if you're talking about open relating. If you're talking about sort of like I'm dating a bunch of people, I, they know that I'm dating people, but I don't, it's not about mixing relationships. Then you're, to me, you're just kind of like dating and not settling in. 
Yeah. If you're into the practice of polyamory or open relationship, there's more of a processing. There's more of a, who are the people you're bringing into your life? Why are you attracted to them? What turns you on? There's something, do you know about, do you know the term compersion? Uh, I do know the term, but I, I don't remember what it means right now. So it's basically like the opposite of jealousy. So it's kind oh, of okay. thing like I'm, I get turned on by what turns my partner on. Yeah. Got it. And there's a very small percentage of the population, I think statistically who are very high natural compersion. Yeah. Jaya is really high on that scale. Like mm -hmm. if I come home from a date and I say that I just gave a massage to the person that I was with, she's like, what? <laughs> she wants to hear stories about how we fucked or like, wow. you know, like all the details. Yeah. So her level of compersion is way up. Mine is more of a philosophical compersion. Like my, I want my partner turned on. I want her happy. I want her excited. So, but it's, it's more aspirational because I definitely have jealousy triggers. I have insecurity triggers and, and can get hooked on them. So one of the things that I would recommend uh, for anybody interested in opening the relationship in polyamory is really start to get oh, uh, familiar with attachment psychology. Mm-hmm finding out what type of attachment style you are, what type of attachment like the, style. Like the avoidant, the, yeah. the avoidant, secure, Yeah, anxious, secure attached, attached avoidance. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a book called Attached, which kind of helps yeah. break it down really well. Yeah, my, um, partner, my partner, Sylvie, she's an expert in the attachment styles. Oh, cool. In yeah. therapy, yeah. So what you're inviting in is you're inviting in an entire universe of attachment style. Even when you invite in that third party person you you're you're bringing in an entire universe of how they relate what they need where their needs won't get met or will get met how they view your partner as a threat or as a benefit so the the, the people that i have witnessed practicing polyamory really successfully they spend a lot of time processing mm -hmm. and they do a lot of group processing Mm. There's no, it's not like that person is just somebody you're dating over there. That person is essentially my partner too. Yeah. So you are adding, asking complexity. You know, I, I think as I was, I, I remember, well, no, I, this was, this is going to be a, this was a terrible uh, an, a sort of connection. But I remember when I went, when I was in, uh, when I was 20, I went to my stepfather's uh, alcoholic anonymous meeting. He finally got sober after being an alcoholic for, decades wow. and I went to his first meeting and I heard the conversations they were having and I thought wow man you guys are having amazing conversations in this 12-step program and um, I thought at that moment again so this is a terrible analogy I'm not comparing alcoholism to <laughs> polyamorous leanings but I just remember thinking wow you guys are really talking about the shit everyone so-called normal people aren't talking about the people the the unafflicted aren't talking about and what I'm really getting present to and and I've, I've never been drawn to polyamory, certainly not at a deep level, superficially, sure, but it's never, it's never been my, my path. But what I'm, really, what I'm really hearing and really understanding is that actually this path really requires an open communication that in monogamous commitments frequently, if not predominantly, uh, is shut down we don't it's not valued i think so i think um i don't know if it's not valid i mean one thing could be it's not valued i think some of the conversations that end up having to happen in polyamorous or open relationships scare the crap yes. out of most people because we have a model that is monogamy based till death do us part reinforced by fairy tales, reinforced by um, sort of uh, making the alternative relationship wrong or taboo. Religion. Culturally, in movies, you know, from the, from what's that vampire series? You know, like there's always these three kind of things. And <laughs> it's always freaking right. trouble, right? Twilight. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting observation. Wherever there's a, 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 tri, a third, a triad, it's not a harmonious one. No. It's a threatened one. Threatened. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that connection. Yeah. So, you know, and then we get into the whole model of, okay, so are we more genetically 
close to the chimpanzee or the bonobo. And uh, a great book for kind of diving into sexual politics is a book called Sex at Dawn. Um, and excellent book. Sex at Dawn goes into often like the kind of the, the so is it our nature or nurture? Is it right. the container that we're in? Our container is one that pushes everybody from the way that we live in these, you know, um, houses all separated from each other, the way that all of the politics are aligned around marriage and taxes yeah. and all that sort of thing. They reinforce a model of monogamy and Polly doesn't have much of an opportunity to have a, a, a nurturing ground. Yeah. Uh, and, and this will, we'll put that book in the show notes uh, at cool. brianreeves.com slash men this way. If you're running or driving and you can't write that down, well, everything will be in the show notes, everything that Ian talks about. Um, there's so much more to say there, but I, I want to move on to uh, a, a related but, but different question um, about what I call winging it. Most of us are doing the wing it method of relationship, of sex. Mm. And I think there's this also, I, I hear this common idea out there, and I'm sure I harbored it for, for many, many years, that sex, it should just be easy. It should come naturally, mm. right? And then when it stops coming naturally, or it never did and or whatever when it doesn't come naturally whether you're with a new partner or or a long time one we think well this we this must not be the right relationship yeah. why is that bullshit mm -hmm. Hmm. well sex I know that's is, a leading question sorry yeah, 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 no, <laughs> but no, we, it's, it's bullshit me up. <laughs> yeah. i'll knock that out of the park yeah so sex is natural and making love is an art you cannot create great art without knowing the full skills of your pal of what your palate, what the opportunities of the palette are, right? So Rembrandt's not gonna make these beautiful portraits without knowing the exact mix, the, without knowing how to do chiaroscuro and create the shading and the realistic proportion of the body and the shape of the hand. The great composer is, has to know the high notes and the low notes and how the flute plays over here and the bassoon drops in here. So the, it's the artistry of lovemaking that is gonna allow people to create long-term passion and not rely on the hormonal limerence attraction mm. that makes it super hot, pretty much, you know, if, if there's attraction there, it's pretty much hot. You got six months, maybe two years. Right. At the beginning of any relationship where it's just like, boom, and in terms of our blueprinting system, most people in that first interaction fall into the sexual blueprint because hormones are high. It's new. Your boundaries are going to be lowered because you're just attracted and you right. want to have sex. Like yeah. eroticism is at its peak. Right. But you as just want, you just, like, just want to fuck, you just want yeah, to ejaculate orgasm and right. uh, get to it. Yeah. I just want to connect or, sense. or, or I lose the boundaries of the things that I've learned that are important to me yeah. because insecurities, my desire to be loved, all of the things that also go on the, in, in those early relationships of does she like me? Does he like me? Do right. they like me? And the, the way we bypass things that might be warning signals like, uh, and then after the limerence, uh, the limerence period, uh, period is, um, talked about as the period that's designed to make us want to fuck so that we make babies and procreate. Mm -hmm. It's nothing to do with love or lasting relationship. Or making lasting, art. Or making art, right? Yeah. It, it gives us like about a two-year window where someone could get pregnant, go through the gestation period, have a child, and get the, get the mother could get back on her feet enough that if the male counterpart disappeared, she and the baby could survive. Yeah. So biologically, we're given that window. And that's where in that six month to two month, two year window, that's in my twenties when I found my relationships totally all fell apart. It's like, wait, mm. I thought we were in love. Oh. <laughs> uh -huh. I didn't know any of this. So, uh, and as limerence dies off, that's when you're sitting in your living room going, wait, I used to go to yoga every Thursday night. Now I'm sitting here watching Netflix with my partner eating the same dinner that we've been eating for six months. And what happened to my friends I used to talk to? And 
So all of the other stuff. And wait a second, I don't really like when you just come on to me and stick your hand in my crotch and say you want to fuck. That not really turns me on. But wait, for six months, two years, you told me that that's great. All of the stuff of our individualized self starts to come back in and needs to find its voice. So why not learn <laughs> from the beginning what your turn-ons are as erotic being, learn the language, learn how to express it, articulate it to a partner so that they, they actually can succeed because our, partner, our partners usually want to win. And also be able to put up the boundaries and say, wait a second, I, I, I know that's turning you on or, or that's something that might get you excited and it's not really working for me, so how can we find a way to come together so what you desire and what I desire can play on the same playground? Yeah. So that's where the that's where something of like the blueprints comes in and really starts to give people the uh, the, the different the different paintbrushes and pencil tools and uh, different canvases to work on. And and I I see we're not gonna I would really love to have you back on uh, Ian and and to dive more into the blueprints if you're open to that. Yeah, for sure. Um, today uh, there's a few other questions I want to get to though that um. Again, to to get your your wisdom, your experience for our the men and many women listening. Um, but we're going to, but just the same. If you're hearing this, I want to encourage you to check out the erotic blueprints. Uh, and again, we'll have a link in the show notes. Do you want to? Can you speak that link just real quick yeah, right sure. now? If you're listening, um, there's a there's an assessment that you can take and find out what your erotic blueprint type is. You'll get a little bit of information about the type great to do if you're in a relationship or just have a bunch of friends and you want to have a great conversation. Um, it's eroticbreakthrough.com forward slash men this way. That'll be specifically for Brian's show. So eroticbreakthrough.com forward slash men this way. Yeah. So that's where you can take the assessment. And, and I, 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 I can't, I can't speak strongly enough. And, and uh, Sylvie and I are, again, we're, we're so tapped into these blueprints. They've been so fucking helpful for us because we don't have the exact same blueprint. Mm. And <laughs> I mean, <laughs> there's some funny stories inside of that that I'm not going to share here in this forum. <laughs> uh, yeah, but um, it's been so helpful to bridge what could otherwise have been some really uncomfortable and awkward and, and hurtful moments. Mm. Yep. So having this, the language of the blueprints has, has been really helpful and, and it's helped us just laugh. Yay. You know, it creates so much laughter rather sure. than confusion and frustration and feelings of rejection and all that stuff. So yep. Yep. definitely, definitely go take that, uh, that, that quiz, that assessment. Um, but I want to, I want to ask you two questions and then we'll, f we'll finish up with our five key, uh, takeaways finale. Cool. The first one is, um, what do you think men really need to know or learn to create a truly fulfilling intimate relationship, whatever format that relationship be in? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think the sort of like the, the, the boiled down. Yeah. Of how no, that's, a, that's a big question. Yeah. And I expect um, an answer in 15 seconds or less. Yeah. You know, this is the sort of like, generic, <laughs> not even generic, but the sort of broad brush is, is really to know yourself. Um, and being a little more specific about that, what does that mean? Um, ultimately, in the true, true reality of all things, I don't believe there is any self. So there's nobody here. <laughs> right, right. It's all just stories. We're just making this whole thing up. Yeah. But there are there are truths there are, there's being the pure raw felt experience and there's being able to dial in and, and, and be aware. Am I in a frequency? Am I existing and being in a frequency right now that's harmonious and creates melody and connection or am I experiencing a disharmonious, atonal uh, twisting of the energy and something's not working. So the, you know, we're, we're, we're in a very mental driven, we're in a very externally driven culture in Western society. And I think there's been so much that's detached us from the ability to just 
take signals from our body. Yeah. We've been kind of implying it and talking about it throughout this entire conversation. Yeah. And there's this phrase of the body never lies. Mm. So the body, the body can tell, tell you things that if you don't know how to interpret it (laughs) or like can lead you on the wrong path. Right. The more you clear away the story, the more you clear away all the noise and get down to the stillness of being able to be present back to that presence piece. Like, yeah. Huh. This is what's happening now. Yeah. This is, this is how this conversation is occurring and where, th- where we, where we're often going off path is not being able to pay attention to the signal in our body that says, okay, my heart rate is now above 100 beats per minute. The moment my heart rate's above 100 beats per minute, my prefrontal cortex is offline. I'm all of a sudden in primitive brainstem forms of communication. Nothing's going to get solved here. Yeah. Nothing creative's going to happen. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to say things that I actually know what I'm saying. And anything that I'm receiving from my partner, I'm going to be interpreting through this lens of fight, flight, fawn, you know, all of the mm-hmm. things that put me in my, my brain stem, my primitive brain stem. So the body signals, I say that that is one of the biggest fundamental pieces of wisdom, being able to get into a place where you can get to a, a nothing space, no matter what is coming at you. Your daily needs, pressures, stresses, your, your partner, wife, uh, you know, same sex partner, whatever. You know, taking all identity out of it is really like, okay, am I in the most resourced place to be able to make a decision that's really grounded in what I'm committed to creating? Right. Here. Right. So that I'm, I'm not hurting others or myself. Exactly. At least not beyond how, we're, how much we're already hurting. And, and I think one thing that I, I noticed too a lot is um, – We'll use, we have to, we have to be really careful how we use alcohol and any kind of drugs, marijuana, alcohol, because those immediately numb those signals. For sure. Um, And alcohol, there's been a bunch of, um, there's a graph. I don't, I can't refer you to where it is exactly, but there's a graph that puts pretty much all the drugs on a spectrum. Yeah. And alcohol is the worst by far on all counts of doing harm to self and doing harm to others. Wow. Yeah. Alcohol, that, that alcohol is legal and 5 million of these other drugs are illegal yeah. is shocking, right? Yeah. 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 So it's, I know, it, it, and, I, and I've worked with men and women who, who have otherwise great lives, but there is dysfunction in the relationship and they don't realize that alcohol is playing a role. They may not identify as addicted and they may not be addicted in the traditional sense. Like, you know, they're getting drunk every day or some big experience, but yet the, the consistent use of alcohol that take the edge off is actually numbing the East, those body signals that, that have it really important information for us. Yeah. For sure. I agree. So I think that's, that's a really great, uh, none, of, none of my other guests have, have brought that one up yet, man. So I think that's, thank you for, for bringing that sure. to the table. Um, and then the last question before the five key takeaways finale, what is the biggest challenge facing men today and what wisdom could you offer in the face of it? I think the biggest challenge and it goes beyond gender is story. Hmm. There, so this is the piece that I, uh, it's, a, it's, <laughs> it's opening up the, the conversation about things that can't be spoken really. Hmm. Um, and it's some of the biggest revelations, the, the pure raw felt experience pieces that have come to me in the last year, um, which have radically changed how I, how I be. Yeah. I mean, I've had, Landmark education, Tony Robbins. I've done tantra workshops. I've done, uh, you know, fasting. You have your own shaman. I get it. Yeah. I've I've, I've done any number of self-help, self-improvement things. Yeah. Um, 
and the la in the last year, some profound experiences that I that have gone through took what was intellectual, like oh, I've read that in a book, yeah, a thousand times, yeah, to a pure raw felt experience. So to get back to your question, and, and what I mean more specifically is that everything going on in this conception, this experience that's being experienced, is nothing but story. Yeah. So everything, <laughs> everything that is story is not what is. And the ability to be in, uh, I say all sorts of weird phrases when I start talking about this, but being, being in the isness that's ising itself mm -hmm. is all that it is. Like that right here, you and me, yeah. there's an experience appearing of Brian Reeves on my computer screen. There's, you know, a breath coming to my body. There's a light in my face. There's a, there's words appearing out of my mouth and, and where story screws everything up. Story is beautiful. Like, you know, that's inspiring. It brings we, we, people we're, to right. we're humans. Heaven. We tell stories. We tell stories. It's how we relate. Yeah. And, if we can stay in the in in a space of a story is just a story and it actually holds no truth. Yeah. There's freedom. There's freedom available in an instant. Yeah. And and in the 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 freedom in relationship, whether it's a work relationship or a partnership relationship, being able to start to become aware of like, oh, this thought just passed through my head creates this physical response in my body. My partner says X, it means this. Uh, now this and that, uh, and now I'm in a loop of a story which I tell myself and I reinforce by finding evidence to make the story more true. So it's the story, the story that I have to be more masculine or more of a man, the story that my wife is, uh, you know, I can never meet her needs and she's a bottomless pit. The, all of the stories and attachment to those stories walk us down a path of illusion. Yeah, that, that fits nicely into the, that phrase, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Mm. <laughs> and, and, if, and, you know, working with couples has certainly taught me that. And, of course, in my own experience, I've lived so much hell despite having the best of intentions. Oh, yes. For everybody. <laughs> and and actually, I'll, I'll if I may take the liberty of putting your the the, the last two answers together because um, yeah. one of the fundamental distinctions that I work with uh, certainly in my own life, but when particularly with couples, it's so helpful um, is is separating story from phenomenon, the mm -hmm. story of the, that we're making up in our minds versus what is actually happening in the body or in yeah. the room in the in this mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. And I think being able to make that distinction gives us, as you said, a freedom mm -hmm. to just be and to even and make way better choices, by the way, right. <laughs> because we're making choices based on what is actually happening in the moment versus the fantasy we're living in, which is often wildly disconnected from what's actually happening in the moment. <laughs> there is no connection. <laughs> There's nothing. None of the past exists, yeah. right? We carry it around with us like it's this big house that we built and now we have to bring it with us to identify and say, hey, this is me. This is what happened to me. This is who I am. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, you know, you, you try and fit that house in the room you're in and you, it's nuts. You know, there's no oxygen left. It's nuts. I mean, look, just, you know, politics is just the stories that are happening there. They're oh. exhausting. It's insanity exactly. nonstop. So, Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. Perfect, man. Thank you. Let's yep. wrap up with our five key takeaways finale. All right. So key takeaway number one is the key insight. And again, you can, maybe you've already said this and you want to highlight it again, or maybe something else comes through, but uh, key insight. What's the one key insight that you would offer our listeners that you believe can make a meaningful impact on their lives because it has in yours? It's exactly what we were just talking about. Start taking the stories that, you, that you're telling yourself. And first off, don't believe a word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just simply look at them. Yeah. And then, and then start, to, start to manage the 
stories, start to tell the story that you want to tell. <laughs> start to create, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna have stories running through your head, and start making ones that really serve and empower, empower your partner, empower the people you're relating with, yeah. empower you to make the choices that create you know, the boundaries and safety that you need to flourish, that really start to draw in the, the, the highest expression of who you can be. Because none of them are real. So why not make up a fantasy that is really beautiful? Yeah. If we're going to tell stories, let's tell better stories. Let's tell better stories. Let's make this a better experience for everyone. I love it. Number two, key mentor. Name another man that you've been inspired by, living or dead, that you would recommend our listeners to learn more about. Uh, so this man came recently into my life and is now uh, becoming full force infused in so many ways in my life. Uh, his name is Satyan Raja, S-A-T-Y-E-N-R-A-J-A. -A. Yeah, he's um, been a guest on the podcast already. Oh, sweet. I so know Satyan. I love Satyan. Cool, Satyan. Yeah. yeah. So um, he's been doing some amazing work for couple of decades, but within the last five years, he started bringing in something he's calling accelerated evolution. Um, and we, we have a whole bunch of coaches that we train in our modality and uh, Jaya stumbled on his work. I mean, she knew him from a while before, but through stuff she was researching, she came across the modalities he's working with right now around accelerated evolution. And the stuff is amazing for rapid dissolution of, of story, trauma, um, you know, disempowering habits and loops. And, excuse me, we're infusing his work directly in with our coaching program. We're bringing him to train our coaches. So Satin Raja, um, Excellent. Warrior Sage, great guy. Uh, we're taking him on as a personal coach for us as well. So. Beautiful. I love Satyan. He is, uh, he, what a, what a, what a deeply generous man he oh, is yeah. as well. Uh, Good. he's also episode 12 of this podcast, by the way. Cool. Yay. Very cool. Uh, number three, key resource, your most impactful, inspiring book, movie, or podcast of the last year. This one's tough, man. I used to do quite a bit of book reading mm. and a and lot of iPhone. And now I'm just kind of like, I'm <laughs> poof. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I can relate. Yeah, I'm really, I'm so in, so immersed in what we're up to and what we're creating. Um, but I think it just guide people back to, you know, if you're, if, uh, you know, blueprints are, are an amazing thing to explore, but that's my personal mission. But I would, I would guide people again, back to kind of like Satyan stuff, but he's got a lot of YouTube videos. He's got a lot of stuff out there. Um, yeah. and it's, it's sort of the, the forefront of, uh, an area that's not the blueprint work that we're doing that I think is going to just have a massive impact on the planet. So I'm going to combine efforts here on this one and say, go listen to Men This Way podcast, episode 12 with Satyan Raja. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Uh, number four, key investment in the last year. What's the best thing that you spent money on under $10,000? Okay. So this one gets a little risky um, and, and it has to do with the pure pure raw felt experience that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So it feels a little vulnerable to share this because I don't talk that openly about this though. Um, it's becoming more common to talk about this stuff in the culture. But um, I had uh, um, uh, guided multiple guided experiences with a molecule called five MEO, mm -hmm. which uh, if your listeners don't know, it's uh, considered a DMT. It's a specific version of DMT. Sometimes people call it the bufo toad um, mm -hmm. venom. The, the, I had had experience with that one once, but the transformative experience that I had, again, it was guided. I was with a, um, uh, a, a mentor shaman uh, who was sitting for all of these experiences. I don't recommend anybody do this from anything you're getting off the street or because it's, 
it's a very massive experience and, and you need somebody who actually knows how to prepare you for it. And so help you integrate. And help you integrate. Yeah. So uh, 5MEO, the, the ultimate one that I had, I've had a couple of experiences with was the pure molecule, wasn't the toad venom. It was just the, exactly yeah. that. Uh, and uh, a completely, it changed everything. And having the sitter and all that was definitely under the ten thousand uh, dollar. <laughs> okay, <laughs> talking about. right. Everything um, it took to have that experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've I, I've had a. a um, I I don't know if it's the same exact molecule, but I've also had the DMT experience. That in DMT, which is uh, a um, a it's 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 DMT. Typically, it's associated with. Um, incredible visuals phenomenon seeing yeah. things yeah seeing and I've done both I've had both experiences right. I actually didn't care for the phenomenological experience I the other experience where I just shattered yes okay that's that's probably the MEO the, yeah, the, the five MEO yeah that that that's the experience that to me was like it was like it was like taking the red pill in the matrix it is it is it's a, once uh, yeah. I mean really it's a 40 minute like deep immersion, but it, it for me, my personal experience, it, it's, <laughs> it lasts forever because nothing will ever be the same. Yeah. And I know what you mean. I, I, uh, I was really scared to talk about it for a long time. I'm a former military air force captain and, and, uh, I did a video about it maybe five or six or seven years ago. I can't remember. And I finally put it out there and, um, I'm so glad that I did. But because um, mm -hmm. I think these medicines, I do believe that I do call them medicines, you know, yeah. psilocybin, DMT, ayahuasca, which is DMT, MDMA, yeah. MDMA absolutely. When done with intention, exactly. like you said, not recreationally. I'm not a fan of recreational use of these, but with intention, probably with a guide or yeah. at least, you know, done in, again in a, in a sacred intentional space. All of that, I think, mm -hmm. I mean, they played a huge role in helping me just heal from my military experience. Great. So, yeah, I mean, that's, there's yeah. huge hope on the horizon here in terms of clinics starting to open up with the MDMA assisted therapy, yeah. all the research coming out with mushroom uh, totally. and therapy and just mind blowing like how quick. Yeah. I know it's, it's an exciting time. Yep. So well, well, beautiful, man. Well, thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate yeah. that. And the last one, the last key takeaway is a key practice. Please offer one practice, spiritual, creative, personal, relational, maybe sexual, that has served you well, Ian, and that you challenge our listeners to take on even just for the next seven days. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm going to take a couple minutes because I just want to guide sure. through this. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's something that I found when I'm teaching people it. most people do need to practice it a little bit to even get how to do it um, because it's a little bit of a uh, uh, brain fuck. Okay. So it's a breath. And the sci I call it the breath of pleasure. Um, there's been some scientific research around this breath where Great. it's basically the ability to rewire in an instant going from cortisol to uh, serotonin and oxytocin and the way the breath, when it's really done effectively, you can feel it. It's, um, it's, it's getting these hormones to bypass the blood brain barrier and go and infuse basically your brain immediately into a soup of serotonin and oxytocin. So, okay. uh, uh, and as I learn how to do the breath myself, more and more, I start to get more descriptive ways to help people understand how to do it. But the basic um, practice is an in-breath on a count of five. Mm -hmm. And at the top of that in-breath, you are neither exhaling your breath nor holding it. So okay. that's the part that's the like, oh, yeah. <laughs> how do I do Through the nose, through the mouth, doesn't matter? It doesn't matter. Your in-breath could be either nose, mouth, in-breath. And so a couple things, I'll, I'll walk you all through yeah. and we'll do the breath together. But a couple of ways to play with this, this kind of mind challenge is um, at the top of the in-breath, you could hold, you could put a little like 
lock on your breath for a moment, hold, and then just release that. And there is a tent, there can be a tension where you're, you're not really holding your breath, but there's a little bit of a tension where it's not just like, shh, yeah, the exhale. Um, and well, I love it. I love it. You're really, you're playing with paradox, which is so beautiful. It's, it's mm. the, it's the, it's the efforting without efforting. Yes. The, yes. The doing there's no, there's, there's nothing to do and no one to do it. <laughs> okay. Right. So, the master, the master does nothing and yet leaves nothing undone. That's right. From the right. Death. I it. Okay. I love <laughs> it. Great. Great practice so far. Um, so, uh, in the, also in the imagination, uh, it's helpful to feel and visualize the breath that you've taken in being absorbed by the body, almost like it's moving through the body to be ex exhaled through the skin. Um, and you will feel some breath coming out of your nose and your mouth. You'll feel your chest depressing and your belly coming in a little bit. All of those things will be there because some, because the, the truth is oxygen, when you breathe it in, builds heat, heat naturally rises. So it just, some of the breath is going to aspirate, but the idea is also to let it absorb into the body. And uh, just another little pointer is to do your best to kind of have a soft, a soft, somewhat straight spine, kind of like a string is holding you to the ceiling. So it's just soft and fluid. Um, and let's just try it. So yeah, let's try it. Okay. I'll, I'll count in on the first two breaths of five, and then we'll stick with it for about a minute of okay. just, playing with it yourself. I'll do a little guiding, but you keep the pace, you keep the rhythm on your in-breath of five. That's the yeah. only thing that you really have to count is the in-breath of five. And it's not like a big breath, it's just a nice, rich, fulfilling, full body. Yep, breath. got it, great. Cool, all right, let's let the air spill out of your lungs, gently, and when you're ready, breathing in, on a count of one, two, three, four, five, and at the top of that breath, do nothing. And don't worry about getting it right. Just simply be with that. And as you, when your body tells you it's ready, you breathe in the next count in breath of one, two, three, four, five. And release, but don't exhale or hold your breath. Imagine it filling into the rest of your body as opposed to dropping out of your mouth and nose. And now going at your own pace. The next breath that you take in, just make sure that your in-breath is a count of five or more. Gently filling your lungs from the belly through the mid chest all the way to the upper chest. And at the top of your in breath, whenever that comes, simply do nothing. Sometimes there can be a tension in the paradox, and it feels like even though you've taken a full breath in, your body needs more breath, you can take a sip in. Sometimes there's a ten enough tension where you really do just need to breathe out and start over. Emptying your lungs. Continue to play with, at the top of that in count of five, five or more. Imagining that there is no out breath that your body is breathing in all of the prana, the chi of the breath that, you, that you've taken into your lungs. And as it's absorbed by the rest of your body, your lungs naturally tell you it's time for more breath. And you breathe in on a count of five or more.
And as you practice this breath, you may begin to notice that it feels like a constant in-breath with pauses. And again, making sure your spine is soft and the back of your neck is open. And at that top of that in-breath, another thing that you can allow your imagination to play with is when you end your in-breath, instead of exhaling, the breath is rising as if it's rising out of the crown of your head top point of your head, looping back out and down and around and in through your root chakra, your tailbone, your base, where you breathe in again. So you're cycling that energy. It's running in a loop. The prana, the chi of the breath in is never leaving your energetic bubble. So just try one more breath. And when you have completed that next in breath, you can just gently, if you had your eyes closed, you can just gently open your eyes. So in that breath, do you feel like you're able to get it? Well, I, I, uh, my body started to get very hot for mm. sure. As I was, mm -hmm. I enjoyed, I enjoyed again, playing with that paradox and in, in the, at the top of the breath, really relaxing my body even more, relaxing my lungs, whatever mm -hmm. that sort of felt like. And so even as weird, it's like holding on to the breath without holding on to it. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. there's that little bit of tension and, um, yeah. what, uh, what people will often report is, uh, a, a sense of warmth or relaxation, um, uh, the energy kind of coming off the back of the spine, kind of um, encapsulating the head, and peace. Mm. And that's the serotonin and oxytocin kicking in. Just for quick clarification, in that as you go to the top of the breath and – because what I noticed was after a time, it's almost like it's almost like how the air would come out of a out of a soccer ball on its own pace. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I would just notice, oh, okay, I need to take a breath again. Is that kind of what the practice is? Exactly. The, the, your body's guiding when it needs the next bit of oxygen, the next yeah. In, inhale. Yeah. And um, and there's all sorts of like the ways that. Uh, I'm starting to play with this breath in terms of mixing in Kundalini practice mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. But the breath on its own, the simple breath here, um, and why uh, I, I pick it as the practice to share with your audience, is in a single breath, you can create a radical state change. Mm -hmm. Once you get this breath, you can be in that conversation with your lover partner that's being challenged be yeah. challenging you can be in the conversation with your boss or the person on the street you can just be in your own conversation in your head that's creating a loop yeah and by doing this breath once or five times you can radically shift your you can you can, you can step into a state of pleasure well, I, I think that's where these, these practices these breath practices are really meaningful is that they really give us access to remaining calm let's just say in what could what is often otherwise a very stressful experience and we're not responding well yeah exactly not, not even present to what's happening not even present yeah, yeah. beautiful uh ian man i'm so grateful thank you so much for saying yes where can our listeners learn more about you we've given them the and maybe that's the place maybe that's the link that you want people to go to but but what what, what would that be the best place for them to go from here so I'm not huge on social media personally. I'm pretty immersed in our little universe. Uh, so coming into eroticbreakthrough.com forward slash men this way, um, 
is the quiz that the, then kind of leads into the universe where we've got a weekly email that goes out. One of the things that's most exciting to me is our live workshop coming up at the end of October. That's the one where that's kind of like the big invitation. You don't have to have done a bunch of our other work to come to that workshop. It's three days. We've where got, is it? It's going to be in the Denver area. Okay. Um, and if, they, if you guys take the quiz, uh, you'll end up hearing about the event and some special offers Great. and stuff that are coming out over the next month or two Great. as we lead into filling the venue. But, you know, it's anywhere from 300 to 500 people. We have a uh, massive um, erotic persona dance ritual thing on Saturday evenings, which is amazing. The, uh, the, fun. Yeah, and it's a dive into the blueprints, into communication. Our workshops are pretty immersive. So it's not, you know, you're sitting in a chair a good deal of time taking in some information, but you're, you're really getting a felt experience of a lot of the stuff that we play with and Beautiful. encourage our, our students to play with. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd love to have you back on again to talk about the actual erotic blueprints. I'd love that. That'd be great. Sure. So good. We'll definitely do that. Uh, Ian, thank you so much, man. It's been an honor to have you on Men This Way. Thank you. It's been an honor to be on the show and uh, you're welcome. And I'm so happy I made the time and, and we could share some time together. Beautiful. We're out.